So I've been away for a week and uh, I went up north to help my son. He bought some land and we had to clear all the trees where the driveway and the house and the shop are going to be. Like the driveway is going to be a long U-shape. You can imagine this long driveway, I would say it's about 100 feet to the first corner and then it's about another 100 feet to the next corner. He's got lots of trees, so we're going through the trees and making this driveway and then the area where the house is going to be. And uh, so for a week, my brother-in-law and my sister and myself, we went up there to chop trees down, pull up roots, and I literally sat in the skid steer for seven hours a day. You know how people talk about the burden of the Lord? The burden of the Lord? I don't see the burden of the Lord as a one prophecy or a vision or a dream. I see the burden of the Lord as the purpose of why you have to teach. That's the burden. So when I'm alone like that, I'm very much at home in a skid steer because we have one as well at home. And so I'm operating the skid steer, but my mind is going, I'm telling you, you don't want to be in my head. Because I'm thinking about all kinds of things about basics. Like today, we're going to go back to basics and we're going to ask the question, who is Jesus? And along with that are the words associated with his purpose. So this is what my mind does when I have time to myself. And I'm not thinking about a message, putting a message together or anything. I'm just thinking to myself all kinds of questions, basic questions. And this process I learned 30 years ago when I repented. I went back to the basics. Who is God? Who is Christ? And here I am 30 years later. I'm still doing it. Why? Because this burden in me to teach correction, I also yearn in my heart for correction. I noticed a lot of people on the internet talking about the name of Jesus and the name of God. It's permeated the YouTube world. People are talking about how you should be saying the name of Jesus, how you should be saying God's name. And so this stirs me up. And so I go back to the, the basics. I asked myself during that week, who is Jesus? All these other people are saying you have to say the name of Jesus, Yeshua. And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why? Let's go back to the basics. Who is Jesus? What is his name? What does his name mean? Because we know, as we study through the Bible, every name in the Bible means something. I enjoy those studies. So, yeah, you don't want to be in my head because I will ask all these basic questions I will not assume anything. I will not assume that I'm correct. I'm constantly reading the Word of God in order to clarify or correct anything that I believe or anything that I say. So this is where my my brain was this whole that whole week when I was working. So we took our RV trailer and uh, my sister, brother-in-law, and myself, we, we set up camp, and yeah, it was awesome. Uh, my brother-in-law did all the cutting 
of the wood cutting the trees down and then my job was to follow after him and pick up all the logs and bring them back and separate them because we want the smaller logs in a pile and then we want the larger logs in a pile and I was doing all of that but meanwhile my brain I'm telling you I'm very much at home in a skid steer so my I'm not worried about what I'm doing I I know what I'm doing in the skid steer my brain is going what is all this teaching on the internet about pronouncing the name of Jesus properly and does he have one name now in the back of my mind I'm thinking oh no he has many names well let's get into it like the the idea of having faith okay faith that's another basic I went back to all that week what is faith what is it faith is trusting someone you know now how do we have faith in God you you've said it many times faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God that's how we get to know God and that's how we get to know Jesus by reading so I thought um, just gonna read all the way through the New Testament first and then there's all kinds of things that come out of the Old Testament as well. Matthew chapter 1, right at the beginning of the New Testament, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Why is it saying it like that? His name, Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Just this verse alone was so profound to me. And here again, we're reading something we have heard all of our lives. Every word in this verse is just like a big neon sign for me. She shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So what you're reading there is the description of the name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Because Jesus is a Greek pronunciation of the name Joshua. Joshua and Jesus mean the same thing. You can now see that the Greek language was also influenced from other languages like Hebrew. Because you have the name Jesus, let's divide it. You have Je, J-E, which stands for God, or Jehovah. Do you see that? And then S-U-S, Sus. Sus comes from a Greek word, Sozo. Sozo is a description of being safe, being whole, being delivered. And I just went through the whole New Testament looking at where sozo showed up, the Greek word, and we'll do that today. We're just going to go through how this word sozo is used. Now, I have questions. This is why you don't want to be in my head. How come all these preachers on YouTube, they're saying that we have to pronounce the name of Jesus properly? But we're reading the New Testament, and it's read in the Greek. It's written in Greek. So what's wrong with saying Jesus? Do you see what's going on? It's legalism again. We have to say Yeshua. That's what they're saying. 
We have to say it that way. It's another burden. That's how I look at it. You're not teaching people the meaning of his name. He shall save his people from their sins. You're teaching people legalistically you have to pronounce his name, Yeshua. Do you see that? That's the flesh again. And it sounds, flesh always sounds like it has something to educate you by. Here we have a standard. We should live by this standard. They're not teaching what his name means to us or what he did for us. They're laying a burden on us, saying we have to pronounce his name different than what we read in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with the name Jesus. It means the same thing as Joshua. Jesus. J, the first part of the word, is Jehovah, saves. Because that's what sozo means. Now there's other things that I see in this verse. He shall save his people from their sins. This is the way my brain works. His people. His people. Now, we know that later on Jesus would teach and say, there's going to be people that are going to come to me and say, look at all the things I did in your name. And I'm going to say to them, I never knew you. They were not his people. They were not his people. What I'm really saying here is that just like these people that are coming to us and saying we need to pronounce the name of Jesus this way, those aren't his people. Yeah. Because they're not yearning for a relationship with Jesus Christ, understanding why he came. See, that's another thing that I was thinking about that whole week. I was thinking about all the basics. What is faith? Who is God? Who is Jesus? Why did he come? One of the things he came to do was save his people from their sin. Then I even asked myself, what is sin? Which sins? Because I know, just like these teachers who are being legalistic, they're saying that if we don't pronounce the name of Jesus, Yeshua, we are committing a sin. <sighs> what are we doing? We're adding to the Word of God. You're making it more difficult for believers to understand why Jesus came. When did he save us? How did he save us? And what did he save us from? These are all questions. And the word of God has all the answers. What's defined sin? It means to miss the mark. Now, you see the flesh says, these are the marks you need to aim for. Say the name. Say the name properly, or else you'll be in sin. No, that's not sin. The real sin is missing the mark of who God is and what he's done to save us. It really comes out in our study today, we'll just get into the Greek word sozo, and you'll see it over and over again. His name is Jesus. Folks, there's nothing wrong with saying the name Jesus the way it's written in the Greek, Jesus. It's Jesus. 
It's the same as Joshua. Even Joshua, throughout the New Testament, you know, there's references that confuse people because they'll say, they'll read the Greek and it says, Joshua couldn't bring the people of God into rest. Jesus couldn't bring, you see, because Joshua and Jesus are the same name. One is Greek pronunciation and the other is Hebrew. And we don't even pronounce that properly. No, there's no sin there. He will save his people from their sin. So then I thought, hmm, when did he save us? How did he save us? And how is this word sozo used? So I simply, in my software, I click on that Greek word, and there's 110 references to that Greek word. Mark is not afraid of any subject. So he thought, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to read the word sozo, wherever it's found. And then he was in the Old Testament as well. And Mark brought this one out. He said, and his disciples came and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. They're in a storm. Lord, save us. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That, that means that the word save us has a broader meaning than what leaders have told us. Because I've heard so many times in my lifetime, thousands of times, we're saved by the blood. We're saved by the cross. Listen, the word save us, it has deeper meaning than we've allowed ourselves to think. We're in a storm, save us. See, the idea of being safe needs to be understood. Save us from the storm. So Jesus did. He came to save. He came to save us from our sins. So, that's exactly what he did. He saved them. Wait a minute, we're not even near the cross. He saved his disciples because they said, save us, we perish. They were f fearful they were going to perish in the storm. That's God's nature. That's God's nature. Because Jesus came to show us his father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Now, I know people would read that and then try to turn it into like a physical mm, saving from a physical storm. Be careful because all of these things that are written in Scripture have a deeper meaning. You know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the Hur uh, uh, is supported by many waters. So, throughout the Bible, I studied this concept, many waters. It always means the multitude. Then you have the raging waves of the many waters. Isn't that what the disciples are caught in right now? The disciples came to him and said, Lord, save us, we perish. Why? Because the waves are coming in. They're it's just dangerous to be out here. Now, when I studied many waters throughout the Bible, the many waters and the raging waves are spiritual words that describe people. They're raging. The many waters. Now, you see why the Hur is supported by many waters. It's held up, and yet at the same time, you have to understand, we will face raging waves. This is the tumult of the waves. It's out of control, and it's also the rage. The words that I've studied all seem to point to 
why people will resist the truth in the last days. Just the very truth that I've just shown you, that there's nothing wrong with saying the name of Jesus. You don't have to be like these new Pharisees that are out making videos that you have to say Yeshua. You can't even say Jesus Christ. You have to say Je Yeshua HaMashiach. How are you going to reach ordinary people with this kind of teaching? You're laying something on them that's hard. That's always the work of the Pharisees. And that's why I say the Pharisees are still around. Oh, and this sounds like revelation. But when people think that way, especially when they're teaching that to the unlearned, really, where does the freedom come? Right. You're not gaining any freedom by saying, oh, I've got to check myself and say Yeshua HaMashiach instead of Jesus Christ. No. Now you are actually trapped. Because you can just stick with simple English and say Jesus Christ and get into the Word and understand what He came to do. There's freedom there. I can tell you that. 30 years ago, I repented. And I'm still repenting. Why? Because I'm willing to go into studies like this and I go back to basics. Who is Christ? Why did He come? And what does it mean to save us? Sozo. What does it mean? Next one that I found in the New Testament is Matthew 9, 21. She said within herself, If I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. That is the word sozo again. I shall be made whole. So the word saved or sozo isn't just referring to salvation, is it? Yeah. It's to be made whole. Now you as well can take that word and realize that part of the process of being saved, and I see it as a process, because we're being transformed into the image of Christ. That's a process. Then go back to Isaiah. Who will I teach? Line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how we grow. From immature Christians to mature leaders and teachers. Well, I, I think about the, the story where Jesus came to the man that was cutting himself, hurting himself. And when the Word of God comes to us, it puts us in our right mind. It right. makes us right, it makes us whole. So the man was not in his right mind, cutting himself. In other words, self-abuse. Yeah. Now, you don't have to do it physically. People do it all the time in their own minds, yeah. self-abuse. That's why we seem to listen to the Pharisees more than people that preach truth. Because we think, I can't get a hold of truth because I don't respect myself. Yeah. I abuse myself. I speak about how stupid I am, how Enable I am to read and learn. I shall be made whole. Yeah. I shall be made sozo. That expands on that word. We need to be made whole. So how do we get to there? We need to come to Christ like she did. And you charismatics, stop talking about, you know, that some sort of power flowed from his garments into her. No. 
she came to the living word and believed. Because Jesus actually turned to her and says, your faith, see, your faith has made you whole. Not the power. Your faith has made you whole. Sozo. You're now saved in the sense of that Greek word. You're saved. You're safe. You're in a safe place now. Why? Because you came to Christ. Yeah. Uh, I, I, in my mind, when you say that, first thing that my mind goes to is, she came to the living word yeah. made flesh. Yep. So anytime we go to the word of God, we are made whole line upon line, precept upon precept. Right. We're made whole. See, my mind always goes back 30 years ago because when I repented, I'm telling you, I repented. I went back to all the basics. Everything. What is faith? Who is God? Who is Christ? Nothing was sacred anymore because I was tired of all the foolishness in our own church, the church I pastored. I was willing to question everything. Such a wonderful time, I remember. Now, other people would be saying, hmm, I don't think I would feel good about questioning my basic beliefs and going back and starting again. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because that is where God's word can teach you. That's true repentance. That's true repentance because you're becoming like a child. I'm going to go back to the basics. Ask the question, what I believe about Jesus, is it all true? Or has some of it come from men, from Pharisees? Like these Pharisees saying, you have to pronounce the name of Jesus, Yeshua. It's a burden. You don't need to carry. And there's no revelation there. The Word of God is your liberty. Even if it means shaking off some man-made ideas you might be carrying, you may have been carrying some additional information about Christ. That's not true. You can let it go. What, is your life going to end? <laughs> no. Start over. I keep saying that. Start from scratch. That's what I did. Are you willing to even take the name Jesus and reconsider what that name means? It's not a burden. It's a wonderful place when you allow the Word of God to teach you. J. Seuss. He came to save his people from their sin. What's the greatest sin? Not knowing the Father. Not knowing God. Yeah. So people will say, He came to save us from our sins. Well, I'm a drug addict. Really? And that's going to keep you from God. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I've been told it's a sin. By who? By the church. And my mind goes, I don't seem to recall a commandment about that. Now, I'm not trying to belittle their dilemma, but I'm saying that part of the burden is not only the problem in your life, it's the teaching that keeps you from God. Well, that's the major burden. Right that's there. the major burden. That teaching is keeping you from God because I've got a problem and I can't come to God without dealing with that problem. See? I say, come to God the way you are. 
He, by his word, will transform you. Next one, Matthew 10, 22. I, I literally just started at the beginning of the New Testament and looked for this word sozo. And isn't this fun? Yeah. 10.22 says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we were saved at the cross. What's this endurance talk? Yeah. Why do I keep going back to basics and making sure, checking my heart, making sure that I understand who is Christ, who is God, what is faith? Back to the simplicity in Christ. Why do I keep going back? Because I understand the burden that I carry. I am not only correcting myself, part of of this burden I carry is to correct. Now, in order to correct others, I have to be willing to be corrected. Some people write me and say, boy, you're stubborn. You won't be corrected. Give me some scriptures. <laughs> I will consider them. It's like that man that wrote us. You have to consider the Assyrian theory again. Read the book of Isaiah and find what it says about the Assyrians. So I did. That is not something I would stay away from. Let's go through the book of Isaiah and look at the Assyrians. Okay. And in the end, I learned things that that man that, who was writing me didn't consider. It's right there. The Assyrians did not teach the children of Israel a lesson in their language. Why? Because I read the very things the man was telling me to read. Now I should go back to him and say, I think you need to reread the book of Isaiah. No, they won't receive it. And throw away the teaching that you have received from other men. Oh no, they won't they won't throw away what they've learned from men. Isn't that exactly what he's saying? You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. If you're gonna follow Christ and continually go back to basics and say, Who is Christ? You will be hated by all men. Why? Because they're not willing to go that way. They will not hear. They will not hear. Who is Jesus? Is he who all the Trinity teachers tell us? Or do we need to dive into the scriptures and reconsider? Reconsider who he is, why he came, how he came, for what purpose? Because it's all about me or I. That's why most people can't receive correction. Because it is about self. It is about image. Like if you think about when I originally repented, I had a lot to lose. I had a church that I could lose. I had... A fellowship with other ministers that I could lose I don't care what I lose I want to know Christ I want to know the truth because Jesus told us if you continue in my word you'll know the truth that truth you learn will set you free the word of God has never let me down ever more liberty, more freedom. What you learn in it, or what you learn to not as important as what you gain. That's right. Well, even in this study, uh, let's go to, I'm glad you mentioned that, Lori, because let's go to Matthew 16, 25. This is exactly what you just said. 
Whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Why does this scripture come up? Because Sozo is in there. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. You mean I can carnally copy the concept of Sozo and make a mess? Yes, you can. If you try to save your life. By the way, the whole concept of Sozo in the New Testament and then the Hebrew meaning of the word save is the idea of to have life. To be in a safe place, to not have a life of turmoil, to have real life. I think of the prophets. They they had this burden to bring the people back to the Word of God, back to God. They exposed the false teachings among the people. And yet those prophets knew that they were safe. I'm I'm not talking about safe from physical harm. I'm talking about I'm safe because I'm doing what God wants me to do. Paul would talk the same way. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a feeling of being torn, isn't it? Yeah. I want to go to heaven. I'd like this to be over. But I also realize that there's something that needs to be said, something that needs to be done in order to get the church ready. And people don't understand that because they say, well, what do you mean? The church is ready. No, it's not. Well, you could even take what we were discussing two mornings ago. Take the idea of Jesus Christ being the rock, okay? Now, That is a whole teaching. But the rock is a mountain. The rock is a fortress. The rock is also a place where a city with walls is built. That's what he's talking about when he says, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This concept of having a true understanding of Jesus being the rock is a safe place. If you get that right, that Jesus is the rock. So when all these other doctrines come around us, we can look at them and we right away have a discernment. Right, because you're on the rock, you're in the fortress, you're in the, the city Oh, the church that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build. This is what you're a part of. This is a safe place. It's a fortress. And all kinds of men will be throwing things at you, trying to attack you, saying that this man's a false teacher. This is a safe place. And I've also taught you in the past that this is a safe place to be as a young believer. If you get this part right, you're in a safe place to grow. You're not being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You have planted yourselves in this safe place on the rock, the revelation of Christ. I heard another famous preacher the other day say that Peter was the rock because Peter means little rock. No, you're not getting it. Peter himself later in his own letters said, whosoever believes in him shall not be ashamed. What's he doing? He's quoting Isaiah 28, 16. I lay in Zion a stone. That's a safe place to be. Even Peter understood that. He never taught in his letters, I'm the stone. What is wrong with these famous preachers? Get it right. You're teaching people error. No wonder they're tossed to and fro. Even that statement that Jesus said upon this rock, he's not talking about Peter. 
He's talking about the revelation yes. that Peter got. Yeah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a safe place to be. That's what it means to be saved. Now, too many of us have heard that we're saved by the blood and saved by the cross. Am I showing you that the word sozo has a greater meaning? Sure. Your whole life can be safe from false doctrine and false teachings while you grow. You're not just saved at the cross. That's the end of the plan. What about the rest of the plan of you being set free, continuing in my word, knowing the truth, and the truth sets you free, growing safely? What does salvation mean? What does it mean to be saved? Because so many people use this phrase, I'm saved. What does that mean to you? I'm saved. No, <laughs> deeper than that. What does it mean? I'm saved. Saved from my sins, I'm going to heaven. Really? That's it? Then I go to another one. Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Oh, well that means it's the opposite of being lost. Doesn't it? That's the chapter where he talks about the hundred sheep and the ninety-nine and the one lost. If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them is gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go into the mountains and seek that which was gone astray? Oh, that's so full of meaning. Gone astray. Twice it's used. Gone astray. Gone astray. That is the word. Same as sin. But it's a path. It's a path where you walk in the way, the way of the Lord, the way of His Word. Now, to go astray simply means to walk off the path. So He leaves the 99 and He finds the one that was lost. Now, I know that as I'm reading this, this is also mentioned in Luke 15. And I like the end here in Luke 15 because it tells you who the 99 are. I say unto you, this is Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Wait a minute. Who doesn't need to repent? Yeah. <laughs> it was the 99 Pharisees that he was talking to because you are righteous in your own eyes. You don't need to repent, apparently. Because you've got everything figured out. You don't need to repent. And while we're in Luke, let's just keep going. I'll go to Luke 18, 42. Oh, this is just a thrilling study. Just finding the word sozo everywhere. Luke 18, 42. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. Whoa, 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 whoa. The man received his sight, and he saved. Do you see that? Why? Because he had faith in Jesus Christ. We, we know this because at other times when Jesus would heal a blind man, he'd turn to the Pharisees and say, Now if you were blind, you could see. Now he's not talking about physical blindness, is he? He's saying, I'm the light of the world. You, do you want to see? Jesus is the source of being able to see. Both physically in this case, but also spiritually. He would take an event like this. The man received his sight. 
turned to the Pharisees and saying, I'm the light of the world. If you were blind, you could see. That, that means you would have to repent and say, I'm blind, help me see. I still have that attitude. Even in this little working trip I had, I was thinking about all these simple words, faith, Jesus, being saved. Are we saved by the cross? Is there? Is that all there is? See, my mind, you don't want to be in my head because my mind is always going a little bit further and saying, I know what men are saying, but what is the word of God saying? So when I hear that word saved, like you were saying, well, when you come to the cross, you're saved. But I think to myself, well, I don't look at it that way. I say, I'm being saved. Yes. It's a process. Yes. Because it's a growing, it's a maturing in God's Word. Mm -hmm. Made real through the image of Jesus Christ. I see it as progress too. Because you're saved, meaning you come to a safe place, now you grow. Yeah. Which means you're being saved even more. Saved from what? The lies of men. The teachings the stronghold kind of teachings that are in the church. You'll never be free unless you ask a question. Where did these teachings come from? Have I believed them in vain? The only way to answer that is to get back into the Word and let it teach you. Let the Holy Spirit of the Word teach you. All right, I think we're going to continue this. Going back to the basics, I think I'll end it there.